let's first up take a look at how the Asian markets have opened and it's a positive start across the Asia Pacific. Inflation's coming down, um, labor supply is up. You could look at uh, testing the weekly upper Bollinger Band, which is at 22,960. Now brokerages have written on the stock, Kotak Institutional Equity says it maintains sell rating and target is rupees 270 per share. Today's standout is on Infosys, just one week before the earnings. Bofa Securities has today upgraded the stock to buy. They have a target price of uh, 1785. 22,730 is where we are starting on the Nifty. We are getting ourselves ready and our vision is to be among the leading uh, green energy producers in the country. The company has been able to beat their FI24 guidance by 61%. Once again, we have a green, green looking screen after hitting those record levels yesterday. Very, very interested in infrastructure. I believe that uh, that would be a very um, high growth area. Markets, they've come up from the highs. Mid-cap index is in the red. So some profit booking is what we are seeing. Well, that's the day so far and it's been a bit of a flip-flop. Uh, the flip came earlier on the way up and then there was a flop. Uh, so we are actually kind of flat uh, so far uh, with uh, the <laughs> intraday chart. Uh, it's flip flipping flop, again flip. now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so yeah, from being down 25, 30 uh, percent, we are uh, back in the <laughs> flat kind of a zone. So it's quieter. It's not up and up. Uh, but this full 60 minutes to go. We are coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Moti Rajaswal Studios. I am Prashant Rima and Surbhi here in the studios. And Nigel is joining us from the newsroom floor. Guys, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Guys, I think uh, it's probably because uh, the market doesn't want the bulls to think that it only goes one way, right? Every day can't be a day of records. So maybe a little bit of flip-flop in between uh, to sort of keep people at the edge of their seats. But for what it's worth, I mean, today's been a good day. Uh, banks have, at least some of the private sector banks, they've had a good session. Some of the large-cap IT names, they've performed. So I think uh, next 60 minutes promise to be exciting. Well, that's right. I think if you want to look at a positive, we're making higher highs yet again, right? Uh, and the lows as well are higher than what we saw yesterday. So that's par for the course, I would say. Uh, the breadth of the market, though, is underperforming. So it's yet another day where you have larger cap stocks that are doing a little bit better. But plenty of winners, actually, from the broader markets as well. Volume's a little bit lower on expected lines because today is a clearing holiday, guys. Uh, for, well, the, you know, the first of the two that we have, right? Uh, the next one, of course, is Thursday. The next one, one Prashant, Prashant, the next one, we participate, right? Because we have the holiday as well. Yeah, <laughs> most important. We have the holiday. <laughs> uh, but, 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 okay, I'll tell you later. Uh, maybe not fully. <laughs> All right, well, uh, you know, markets are, uh, uh, for now, just to take that point, and mar uh, markets are off. I mean, I don't mean that markets are on. Markets are off. Uh, so, you know, cool off from the day's highest level. Uh, essentially is what we've seen. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, uh, what, what, where, you can, where you can uh, put trailing reversal levels, stop levels, right? The uh, first would be 22,609. We didn't get there, by the way, the day's low. And of course, if uh, the market continues to turn, then that uh, goes out of picture. 20, 20, that's a 20 hourly average. And then the 40 hourly exponential is at 22,537. These are the very shorter term, very, very short term uh, sort of averages. Uh, that uh, you can use as uh, sort of reversal levels. Nifty Bank, I mean, when we walked in, was absolutely flat, but as I can see now, uh, that is doing better. I mean, you got about a third of a percent gain there on the Nifty Bank. Uh, PSUs, you know, PSE stocks, energy, CPSC, generally speaking, uh, there is some pressure. Nothing large, but half a percent, one, one and a quarter percent kind of pressure is what we have there. Rima. Well, uh, private sector financials are holding up pretty well. So ICICI Bank, it was an underperformer, especially compared to HDFC Bank, but ICICI Bank has come back. ICICI Bank is up close to about 2%. Axis Bank also up nearly half a percent. But, you know, it's predominantly ICICI Bank, which is holding for Infosys is looking up. Nimesh has been talking about it. Uh, Infosys has a gain of nearly 1%. And Apollo Hospital tops the chart in the large cap uh, space. On the losing side, Reliance Industries has been struggling, sluggish, down 1.5%. Titan is down 1.5% too. And a couple of the other notable losers include Coal India, Hero Motor Corp. Um, so that's where a bulk of the pressure is stemming from. Yeah, absolutely. There has been some profit taking in auto for sure. On the mid-cap side of the screen, I mean, trends are interesting. Uh, once again, the wealth managers, at least some of those stocks have been doing really well today. So, Novama Wealth, and that's because of a Jeffrey's note that came in. Anand Rathi is looking at a buyback. So there's some news around this one. So, as you... <coughs> Excuse me. Wealth management stock stocks have had another good run. Exide has put on another 2% today. Uh, so these are some of the names that are standing tall. Sterlite uh, Tech, 
which is looking at a QIP, looking at some fundraise. That's uh, really been on investors' radar with about a 9% gain today. But otherwise, I mean, if you look at the price and volume action, then quite a few of uh, Nigel's metal stocks, they're finding takers, Nalco, Sale, etc. Uh, quite a few of them, even beyond the large caps uh, like, uh, you know, Tata Steel, etc. Uh, even the non-ferrous PSU plays on metals, there's some green over there. Nigel? Well, that's right. Uh, you know, it appears it's more global in nature because fundamentally on ground, I don't think things have changed much. So ahead of that inflation print, Chinese data looking a little bit better, the global data as well looking a little bit better, and the dollar index is softer. So I guess put all that together explains why some of these metal stocks are moving up. But just around five, six sessions ago, I told you that, in fact, if you want to play the metal theme, I know it's a risky one, but Vedanta is there because it's giving you exposure to everything, to a little bit of crude, a little bit of uh, base metals, including silver as well as, uh, you know, uh, zinc via Hindustan Zinc. So Hindustan Zinc from there is up close to around 17-18% odd. And Vedanta in these last 4-5 days, that's up more than 10%. So you now both these two stocks have done well because it's the pure metal play and Hindustan Zinc is the only way to play silver, as we've been saying on this show as well as on Basar. But how do you position yourself though in the final hour of trade? Mitesh Thakkar joins us. Mitesh, uh, you know, if you sold out at the morning gap up, you would be quite happy. But if you didn't, then what's the view? So, uh, Nigel, I think, you know, the idea is that when the market is trading at new high and making a gap of opening, typically you don't tend to sell, you trail your stop losses. And uh, I am right now at about 22, 570, 560. So I think that being the key support area. So, we just hold on, you know, hoping that the level is in breach and we still get higher highs. So, that's the idea. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the bank nifty is still trying to get past and stay above 48,700. If that happens, then I think that will be a sign of strength. So maintain a positive bias till, you know, we get some kind of reversal and stop and, and get stopped out. Uh, on the stock side, though, I think, uh, you know, I have one buy and one sell. Uh, BPCL is something, you know, which is breaking down. So sell here with the stop just about 595. Uh, look for a target of around uh, 565, 564 on the downside. While Chola Finance is on the buying side with a stop at about uh, 1184 and a target of 1260. Okay, those were some uh, trading ideas. Uh, real estate started off trade very strong. The real estate index was up 2%, but now those gains have whittled down. So now just holding up with a gain of about 0.4%, that's the real estate chart for you in today. Uh, but in that, you've got a few winners, and one of them is Godrej Property. So the, here, the gains are intact. In many of the other real estate stocks, you've seen a profit booking set in, but Godrej Properties is still holding up with a gain of 4.5%. Came out with your Q4 update. The numbers look very, very strong. Sona joins in with the details over here. Sona. Well, it was the highest ever quarterly sales or and the yearly sales that the company has seen as well. And it is the highest that we've seen in the listed universe. The company has been able to beat their FI24 guidance by 61%. So the sales are 61% higher than what they had actually anticipated. In terms of quarterly numbers, the bookings are up 135%. Their volumes are up 52%. And in terms of the annual numbers, their bookings are up 84% to come to 22,500 crore rupees. We spoke about uh, Prestige yesterday. Their sales came to 21,040 crore rupees. If we talk about volumes, they were up 31% as well to come in at 20 million square feet. Uh, they are largely a Mumbai-based player, but their NCR region has done really well, up 180% on a YY basis to come in at 10,000 crore rupees. Their Mumbai sales were at 6,500 crore rupees, which is a growth of 114%. As I said earlier, it's been the highest so far in the reported listed space and looks like it could be um, in terms of sales. So the list suggests that Prestige Estates came in at 21,040 crore rupees, their Signature Global at 7,270 crore rupees. Macrotech at 14,520 crore rupees and Godrej tops the list of all the listed developers who have reported numbers so far. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, NCR contributes much more to Godrej properties than the MMR region. Uh, so that's interesting. So no longer just a Mumbai-based uh, player, Godrej uh, Properties. Uh, let's uh, invite Sudeep Band Bandupadhyay, Group Chairman at Indie Trade Capital with us on the show. Um, Sudeep, Godrej Properties? Great companies. I think amongst the real estate players, Godrej has always been one of our favorites. Uh, you know, apart from NCR, where, where they have now a significant presence, uh, and Mumbai, they have now entering multiple southern markets. Uh, they have recently acquired uh, properties, large tracts of land in Hyderabad. And as we know, with the GCCs uh, coming up in a big way in Hyderabad and Bangalore, I think the opportunities there are significant. 
Uh, Hyderabad that way doesn't have any uh, local uh, uh, recognized big player. Uh, so obviously uh, the potential uh, is there. Of course, the other developers are also getting into Hyderabad, but I think uh, Godrej, I think for them, the next market is Hyderabad, which I think is a good strategy to take. Uh, overall balance sheet uh, remains strong and the parentage of course is uh, impeccable. Under the circumstances, Godrej properties definitely is a good uh, pick uh, amongst the real estate players. Okay, that's uh, Godrej Properties. Stock's been doing well, not just today, but in the last 12 months as well. By the way, some more movers and shakers. I just noticed on uh, my screen, a couple of names perk up from the consumer space. Today is a good day for Page Industries, 3-3.5% three, three higher. Uh, there is buying on uh, Devyani International. By the way, in the morning on trading hour, we were in conversation with uh, uh, Elara. And Elara's take is that in the QSR space, we'll probably have uh, the, the KFC players, fried chicken players, Devyani and Sapphire. They will do much better in terms of same so store sales growth as compared to the pizza guys, Jubilant and the others, uh, which will probably have same store sales compression uh, in, in quite a you know significant magnitude. So Devyani is up and, up and about. SBI card has had a very decent last couple of weeks. Another 3.5% up on SBI card. Sudeep, hi, great to have you on the show. Let me ask you about SBI card, obviously completely battered stock, right? And we all know the reasons why. What do you make of this little uh, interest, buying interest that's now starting to emerge? And, uh, you know, would it make the cut for you despite all the regulatory headwinds? Well, no. Uh, first, uh, definitely, I, I doesn't make the cut for me yet. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It was a completely bombed out area. And, uh, you know, it was down in the dumps for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, I think some of the uh, 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 market participants are looking at value buying in SBI cards at this stage, considering that the parent page and the potential. But as things stand today, I think uh, we'll have to wait and watch. There are lots of regulatory challenges. And, uh, you know, the asset quality improvement is still, uh, you know, not, not, not over. I think there is still a long way to go before we can say the asset quality has improved. Mm, so far in April, and it's hardly been a few trading sessions. We're only on the ninth today. SBI card has put on about 10%. So there are, uh, there is some consistent buying that's uh, picking up. Does it signal a bottom? Well, we'll find out. Uh, but with that, let's move on and uh, address some of the wealth management stocks that are in focus as well today. Jeffrey's put out a note, and they're sounding quite optimistic on two of them. One is Novama Wealth, and the other is 361. Vamakshi is here with the details. Vamakshi, what is Jeffrey saying? Well, absolutely. Both of these counters in focus and Jeffries is saying that they expect Indian wealth managers to, uh, uh, to grow at a very healthy pace. Uh, they believe that they are well placed to ride on India's economic growth and financialization of savings. Large wealth managers, in fact, are expected to deliver nearly 22 to 25 percent CAGR in active AUM over the next three years. And this will largely be driven by net inflows of almost 12 to 17 percent from higher wallet share, expansion in newer geographies, as well as MTM gains. Industry shift to full trail model as compared to upfront commission also provides long term revenue visibility. In fact, the share of annual recovering revenue, uh, recurring revenue uh, has risen to almost 60 to 65 percent uh, as compared to 40 to 50 percent in FY20 in the UHNI segment. And in fact, it is expected to rise further to 70 to 75 percent by FY27. Operational efficiency is expected to kick in and this will compensate for fee compression. Uh, they are also expecting leading players to deliver almost 20 to 22 percent of profit CAGR over the next three years. So all in all, their uh, earnings visibility for wealth managers is improving, which is in turn supporting the valuation re-rating in Jeffrey's opinion. So given all of those factors, they've gone ahead and initiated coverage on Novama as well as 361 with a buy rating. For 361, they have a target price of 900, while for Novama, they have a target price of 6,000 rupees per share. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much uh, uh, for that, Eva Makshi. So that's an interesting sort of new initiation and so much initiation in that space, right? Uh, wealth managers and many of these are uh, companies or businesses which have been spun out of uh, consolidated listed companies. Uh, now, of course, trading separately and we've got three or four of these. Uh, the two, of course, in, uh, in that report on Novama and uh, 361. Uh, Sudeep, uh, you know, do you own uh, any of the sort of wealth established wealth managers? And as an old one, uh, what's the best way to uh, sort of uh, play in the capital markets? Uh, is it exchanges, is it AMCs, or uh, is it some of these wealth managers? 
Well, I think uh, one part, Prashant, is definitely it's worthwhile uh, being uh, in this entire ecosystem. I think financialization of savings is happening at a record pace. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about it for the last 20, 30 years, but now finally it's happening. Whether it's a DMAT account, whether it's the volume of trading, whether it's the, you know, business wealth managers are clocking. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, and whether it's a dematerialization happening. So I think it's a good ecosystem to be in. Now, considering the valuation at which uh, some of these uh, uh, companies are trading, one has to be a little careful. But for a long-term investor, I think CDSL still uh, holds a lot of value. Uh, uh, we, we don't have an SDN listed yet. So CDSL is the only place in the depository space where the insurance uh, uh, also insurance policies are also getting dematerialized. So the scope increases further. As far as the wealth managers are concerned, instead of picking up one of these uh, companies which are being talked about, I would suggest picking up Makila as well. I think you get uh, multiple other businesses as well along with that. Uh, you know, some of the new newer newer ones are also coming. But at this stage, I, I would stick to Motila Oswal, considering the valuation and uh, uh, CDSM. All right. Uh, hi, Sadeep. Good afternoon. Good to see you in. Uh, what about uh, Page Industries? You know, I think uh, should be mentioned that the stock is seeing a bit of a spike up. It's up close to 3% and holding strong. You know, a bit of a wobbly market. But I just plotted a one-year chart. The stock is unmoved. So it's been a relative underperformer. Valuations maybe went out of whack, performance didn't keep up, and that's why the stock is consolidated. Your view at these prices? Nigel, I completely agree with you. I think uh, there are lots of challenges the company has, particularly the competition. Now, the competition is really uh, there, and it's, it's for real. Uh, whether it's uh, Van Hussein or, or the other established brand also competing in the same space, or uh, the other uh, smaller, smaller brands coming in and competing, uh, I think that competition is ensuring that the margin uh, gets continuously eroded and the volumes also remains under pressure. So under the circumstances, the dream run, which we have seen in page industries, I think that's a thing of the past. We have to keep uh, watching the space because it's an interesting area. It's a well-managed company, but uh, to expect it to do wonders, even from current level, I think it will be a little too much. So it's better to stay away and watch the space carefully. By the way, IFL Finance has been creeping up slowly and steadily. The low on IFL Finance was 313 towards the end of March after the regulatory clampdown. And from 313, the stock has now risen to about 439. So there has been a 120 rupee pop in IFL Finance over the last couple of days. Pull up a you know, one month chart uh, and you would see uh, first the big fall, the slide, and then the little bit of a recovery. Uh, that's ensued in IFL Finance. Today also, on pretty good volumes, the stock is up close to about 3.5%. Uh, Sudeep, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining in. We need to slip into a very short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Rajesh Kothari, Managing Director and Alf Accurate Advisor. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're with us on uh, Closing Bell. Just want to point out some more stocks. Let's see if we can pull up Castrol. Speaking of stocks that are spiking, big, big move on Castrol right now. Almost a 9% move on this one. Decent volumes as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, the stock's done well so far in 2024, 25% higher. But today's move is particularly uh, sort of pronounced. It's a big one that's coming in. So the short point is that while the mid-cap index is telling us that there's about a quarter percent drop on it, Individual stocks, uh, moves and shakers are always there. And to Nigel's point, really, Vedanta and Hindustan Singh, they really take the cake in terms of the uh, metal price action that's going on, uh, really burning up the charts over there. So uh, that's the story. What's noticeable is that the, the uh, sort of uh, you know, fizz we had on IT in the morning, 
that fizz has worn off, uh, Rima. I mean, of course, on Infosys, there is the note, the BOFA note that Nimesh alerted us on. But overall, I think the, the morning approach to IT was a lot more uh, sort of excited. But I guess the reality is, as you've been telling us, that this is going to be probably a very quiet quarter. Very One quiet. can only hope for slightly positive commentary about FY25. Maybe towards the end. I think mm -hmm. the management's just strike a cautious note. But by the way, uh, some fizz is coming back in auto. Look at m and m m and has suddenly moved up close to about 1%. Aisha Motors has been steady since morning. So Aisha Motors is up 1%. But m and is a stock where buying has emerged in the last few minutes. And outside of that, BEL, BEL on pretty good volumes is now up close to about 2.5%. So that's also another big uh, mover. But let's uh, turn our attention now to a CNBC TV18 exclusive. Earlier today, we caught up with Mark Mobius, chairman at Mobius Emerging Opportunities Fund. He expects major growth potential in the railway sector in India. He also adds that tech and infra will see increased investments if Prime Minister Modi is re-elected. Listen in. You look at the long term, India looks terrific. Uh, uh, it's got the right population structure. Uh, now with uh, China slowing down, India is going to be taking up the slack in terms of manufacturing and exports. So India is in a very good position. There's no question about it. I believe that uh, the position of most investors around the world are beginning to change. Uh, they've, of course, been burned very badly in China, and they're looking for another place in which to invest. And India seems to be the, the logical choice. Now, of course, for global investors, uh, they've been making good money in Japan. Uh, the U.S. market has done very well. But at the end of the day, uh, India is now beginning to outperform the U.S. market, and it makes sense for people to look at India. Now, of course, there's a problem of size. Um, there needs to be more equity offerings in India, more IPOs, and hopefully more uh, government enterprises being uh, uh, listed in the market, because, uh, as you know, uh, India has some very large government enterprises that could be listed. We're seeing, of course, is Modi becoming stronger politically. In other words, uh, uh, it looks like he's going to have a, a larger, uh, a stronger position in the political structure of the Indian market. And that is very good news for investors because it means that he's going to continue to push for uh, technology in India and the application of technology. That's number one. Number two, he's going to be pushing more for infrastructure. I'm very, very interested in infrastructure. I believe that uh, that would be a very uh, high growth area. Uh, rail, uh, the rail sector is very, very interesting. And the air airline sector is also interesting. Every portfolio should have some physical gold. Uh, very, very important. Um, and you can see what's happened to gold and silver. Silver is going to be, uh, already is outperforming gold. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. Probably the primary one is that globally, there's a new generation of investors who really don't um, trust the central banks around the world and don't trust the currency. And they want to hedge their portfolios by buying gold and silver. So that's going to be a very interesting development. And of course, as gold moves up, other metals move up as well, because they, they're betting on commodities in general to preserve their wealth. If you see rates come down, uh, it'll be more attractive to go into emerging markets. But the shift to emerging markets have already begun. Uh, you must remember that if you look at the US market and the Indian market as a good example, but other markets, uh, Korea has done well. Uh, Taiwan has done very well. So uh, people are beginning to diversify away from the U.S. market, knowing that the U.S. market has performed very well, but may not continue. All right. That was Mark Mobius as optimistic on India as ever and saying that, you know, he's looking at uh, quite a few themes, including PS2, specifically in the infrastructure space and uh, looking at what perhaps if we get a stronger Modi 3.0, what perhaps will then mean for the investing climate. Well, speaking of opinion, we also caught up with Prateek Gupta, the CEO and co-head at Kotak Institution Equities, got his outlook on foreign investment coming into the India. 
the market outlook from here on and of course the top sectors that he likes. Take a look. Uh, as far as foreign investors are concerned, they still like India from a medium term perspective in our interactions with global investors around the world. Uh, uh, from a longer term perspective, everybody is extremely positive. But uh, but as far as India is concerned, everybody is positive, except they're just sort of holding back for the time being, either waiting for a market correction or waiting for some events to get more clarity on the earnings outlook. The U.S. Fed starts uh, cutting is likely in the second half of this uh, calendar year. Uh, that is one potential trigger, which typically means a weaker dollar and money flows into emerging markets. So that time you will see... Uh, you know, EMs like India in particular get a disproportionate share. Top uh, three, four high quality PSU banks still look very attractive. We are in a benign uh, credit cycle from a from an NPL cycle perspective. We think NPLs will remain under control. Loan growth is still picking up. Most of these PSU banks have very strong liability or deposit franchises. Uh, the ROEs are inching up. And as you rightly said, valuations are still quite attractive. So we like uh, some of the top PSU banks. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the private banks uh, have underperformed quite a bit in the last uh, one year or so. Uh, first and foremost, I would say any company which is more export oriented, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, the, the global economy is still slow. Exports are still weak. There again, uh, I would still focus more on the commercial vehicle side than on the passenger vehicle or the two-wheeler side. Uh, in the two-wheeler side, there's a, uh, still a very, very big risk of disruption from EVs. Um, on the passenger vehicle side, we find valuations being a bit stretched, which is why the commercial vehicle segment is where uh, we think, uh, you know, uh, stocks, we like stocks like Tata Motors, for example, uh, uh, where, where we think, uh, you know, they're doing both on the PV side and the CV side, they're doing quite well. Uh, the auto ancillary is another way to play the sector, uh, but most of the auto ancillary companies, unfortunately, are export-oriented. Okay, well, uh, that's Pratik uh, Gupta of Kotak with his uh, perspective on uh, markets. Well, Rajesh Kothari is with us, Managing Director at Alpha Accurate Advisors. Rajesh, a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here on Closing Bell. You know, auto angst is uh, a space that you like very well as, uh, as well. But auto angst is, uh, you know, it's a pretty vast area, right? And yesterday, uh, there was a, a lot of excitement around Excide with a tie-up with Hyundai and Kia. Uh, what part of the value chain in, in auto angst uh, are, you, uh, are you bullish on? What do you like? I think, uh, you know, post this, uh, what I would say, change in technology, uh, there'll be clear differentiation between uh, winners and losers uh, within the auto ancillaries. And uh, there'll be many businesses within auto ancillaries which will be get disrupted. And at the same time, there'll be many auto ancillaries which will be capitalizing on this new trend. The benefits are increasing electrification of the vehicle. Very important word, the electrification, right? Uh, the play on safety norms, uh, the play on higher content per vehicle, the play on more sensors, and so on and so forth. Please remember the established auto ancillary companies maybe say 10, 15, 20 of them, they are fixed. Only 15, 20 companies are established, big companies. And any OEM, be it a Hyundai or be it a Suzuki or be it Toyota, they would like to work with these existing companies of 10 to 20 set. And therefore, the size of opportunities for these companies is tremendous. Please also remember that as the more electrification, or for example, you talked about the batteries, as that happens, the content per vehicle goes up significantly. So for example, if you are buying the normal, uh, you know, current battery for your car or for two-wheeler, and when you buy for the electric vehicle uh, battery, or whether it's a four-wheeler or two-wheeler, it is not 20, 30% increase. It is a five to 10 times increase in the cost. So it means the 10X or 7X is the size of opportunity for the any player who is ready to cater to this opportunity. So I think the growth is going to be significantly higher than the underlying volume growth of auto OEM players. And therefore, auto ancillary, uh, we like this space. The very important point is here, the valuations are also quite reasonable. Many of these companies are debt-free. Most of these companies have historically 18 to 20% return on capital employed. And they are very, very strong leaders. They all are oligopolies or monopolies in this sector. And they are trading at probably below 20 times price to earning multiple. And I think that's the best combination what we get when everybody talks that markets are at an all-time high. 
and everything is expensive, but we don't think so. And there are so many such opportunities uh, within these established players which you can capitalize. Where else are you sensing opportunities? You know, many of the stocks are great if you already own it. So I was seeing your, you know, top 10, you know, stocks. You've got a trend. Uh, that's done very well. Uh, BHEL has also been quite the outperformer. But to enter at current levels, where is the opportunity now, Rajesh? So, well, you know, these companies, what we own, uh, you know, we continue to remain positive, right? Because uh, just, uh, you know, this basically passed. The important is how do we see the future? And unless we are positive on those companies, uh, we would not continue to own. We will get out of it, right? So I think the growth is important, and at what valuation are playing that growth, both are important. So the companies, what we own portfolios, if you look at our portfolio level, our earnings growth of portfolio is about 25 to 30 percent. And uh, you know, and that too with a balance sheet, which is the best of the balance sheet and best of the governance. Now, when you put these three things in combined, the large profit size, big growth, and debt-free balance sheet or under leverage balance sheet with the best of the management, uh, definitely you might have to pay a little bit premium. But then it is justified uh, considering the kind of opportunity of what these companies are playing on. Mm, okay. Well, uh, just to go back to the screen, I can't take my eyes off on the move on Hindustan Zinc, by, by the way, right now. It's a 14% move that has come through. Stock I mean, has been an underperformer. Otherwise, if you look at the rest of the market and look at the kind of high flyers we've had in the mid-cap space, but this is absolutely phenomenal what we are getting today. This month's move, again, just April, uh, we're talking 34% on Hindustan Zinc. Big, big one out there. Perhaps the fact that now silver is playing a bit of a catch-up with gold prices. Maybe that's also rubbing off. Uh, and then, the, of course, uh, good zinc production numbers that Nigel was alerting us on earlier. Uh, you know, Rajesh, let me ask you, hi, good afternoon. Uh, do you have any interest in metals? Where do they, uh, you know, if, where are they in your portfolio if you have any exposure? And any thoughts on, you know, something like a Hindustan Zinc? Uh, it's a composite play on a lot of things. No, currently we do not have any exposure on metals and, uh, you know, I think the why we don't have exposure because uh, many of these things are unpredictable, particularly the tariff policies by the, you know, the, uh, you know, the global countries, be it US, be it China, be it India, and that keeps changing. So extremely volatile, very difficult to predict. Uh, nevertheless, uh, one thing is for sure, the metal companies' balance sheets have improved significantly in last uh, two and a half, three years post-COVID. And uh, therefore, one round of re-rating is happening because of that. Uh, you know, the, but currently we don't have any exposure. And I think there are enough opportunities to play uh, beyond metal, which are more uh, stable, more predictable, and with a better uh, balance sheet and uh, better growth opportunities. All right, uh, Rajesh, just hold that thought. You know, Sudhir, I just want to make one point on Hindustan Zinc. Uh, there's a free float factor as well that plays out, right? Because Vedanta Limited has 65%. The government of India has 30%. And institutions mm. have more than 3%. So effectively, there is only 2% that is tr freely, freely traded stock, 2% at the most. So that's why, in fact, you normally see such large size moves on that. The Fundamentally, yes, that is the play on, on silver. But valuation-wise as well, you know, I think going by today's stock price, it's out of whack. You know, on an EV upon a beta basis as well, it's more than 10 times also. The float is very limited. So that's why the other way of playing it is go with Vedanta, which is a more liquid name and which has 65% stake in Hindustan Zinc. So just wanted to tell our viewers that. And the street is working with around 25, 25 and a half dollars per ounce. And current pricing is closer on $28 per ounce. So that's the reason why there is an upside that's coming in there. So just uh, clearing out the end, that's why you see such large size moves on stocks like, um, like Hindustan Zinc. Uh, well, let's go back to Rajesh. Rajesh, I recall, you know, on the travel and leisure space, you'll be quite positive. You'll be playing it via different ways. Uh, what is your thought process now on that space? We continue to own, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, largest luggage, uh, you know, player uh, in the industry. They continue to gain market share. And we are quite positive on this uh, overall leisure as a theme, as an opportunity. And uh, I think uh, uh, here again, uh, the consolidation, the benefits of the new product launches, uh, the benefits of, uh, you know, better product mix, all that basically goes in favor of Safari, uh, which we continue to own uh, for almost like two and a half, three years. It's one of the biggest uh, success story, uh, you know, uh, uh, in our portfolio, particularly near our triple-A budding beast. Uh, please put a disclaimer because uh, this is a company which we uh, own for our clients in our triple-A budding beast PMS. Mm. Uh, Rajesh, uh, you know, I, I know that you typically stay away from talking about names, but uh, what have you uh, sort of bought recently? If you can share anything new which uh, which has come on your radar. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, there was a big block which happened, uh, the company called Max Estates, and you, you uh, sort of picked up 
some quantity. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But just uh, if you want to confirm or... And tell us what else have you done? Uh, yeah, uh, please put a disclaimer. Yes, we currently own, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Max Estate, what the company, what you mentioned. Uh, we, we, we believe that the real estate is, a, is a definitely a good story. Last three years have been good. Typically, the cycle lasts for, you know, seven to eight years. And within this entire, you know, the universe of the real estate companies, there are only few companies on which you can trust in terms of the corporate governance, in terms of the balance sheet, in terms of the, you know, the trust uh, from the customer's perspective and so on and so forth. Uh, Max is one of them. Uh, and surely, uh, you know, kind of growth plan, what you look at it, uh, you know, uh, and kind of what I would say the launch is what they've done in a very niche player, Noida market player. Uh, is being uh, phenomenally successful. So, uh, you know, we like this story and we believe the company will do well. In terms of otherwise, you know, the action plans, uh, you know, pharma is one sector uh, which we are adding from last, uh, you know, two months or so. Uh, I think uh, pharma space is showing good opportunities. Uh, the growth uh, for F525 and F526 is going to be better. The US pricing pressure is over from last two quarters. And I think uh, from here again, the growth will going to do uh, you know a little bit better compared to uh, the overall universe. And the valuations are again reasonable. You know, please remember when the markets are at this level, uh, there are two important things to keep evaluating. One is the growth, and second is at what valuations you are buying the growth. Uh, I think the, in that uh, what I would say matrix, uh, pharma fits well. So we have been adding to pharma space uh, from last uh, few months, apart from auto ancillaries, uh, which we talked about. Both fits into our, you know, growth at reasonable valuations. You know, uh, so these are the basically opportunities what we are doing uh, in uh, the recent actions. Sorry, uh, Rajesh, you said ma uh, ma matrix, is it? No, what I'm saying, this basically fits our oh, the in the matrix. In the okay, yeah. okay, all right, okay, okay, got that, got that. Sorry, I thought so you were. Both fits our matrix of growth at reasonable valuations. Got it. Got, got it. it. Uh, Rajesh, uh, you bought, I think you own some mid-cap IT names, Birla Soft, KPIT, CoForge. These are so some stocks which feature in your portfolio or at least had. Would you look to expand that list of, you know, the IT stocks or are you just comfortable with these three? I think uh, we are comfortable with these three. Uh, you know, one of the product companies we are evaluating within IT uh, and there are few platform companies what we are evaluating uh, in IT. Uh, we already own one of the largest uh, platform company. Uh, you know, which is in the insurance space from quite some time. And we are evaluating few more such platform companies uh, within IT. So IT, we are basically dividing between a normal IT space, a number one, number two product companies, where we have the few companies in our portfolio. And number three is the platform companies. So we are more becoming increasingly, we are adding exposure to the product companies and also the platform companies. The normal IT services weightage, uh, we are quite comfortable where we are. Uh, but the other two weightages we are adding up. Uh, you know, so, and it is doing quite well. So when you mean platform, you mean a company like Rate Gain or and not product companies, right? You, you, you are right. We, we do not own that name, but we own, for example, uh, you know, Intellect. It is part of our fact sheet. It is disclosed to investors. Please again put a hmm. disclaimer. So we own Intellect, which has been doing well. Again, when we bought this company, it was trading at around 23, uh, you know, 22 times actually price earning multiple, the product company and with a good growth. Uh, of course, the stock has uh, done extremely well for us, already up probably 40-50% uh, since our purchase price. But we keep evaluating such names uh, as a product companies as well as the platform companies. Okay. All right, uh, Rajesh, we will leave it there for today. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. Good to get uh, that perspective and uh, a lot of that advice from you. Well, with that, we do have to take a break. The news is that the Nifty is still nursing a cut of about 30-odd points. So... The fact that banks are outperforming, that's not uh, entirely being able to offset the pressure on some of the bigger stocks. Look at Reliance now. Reliance has been a culprit for the better part of the last many, many weeks. Today is no exception. And now that stock is down a percent and a half. Reliance Industries, there you go. Day is low on RIL. We'll take that break, come back and keep cracking the markets. And of course, we'll get you all the buzz from dealing rooms as well.
Welcome back. Well, the markets are actually not seeing follow through. The Nifty Bank has come off considerably from the high point of the day and the Nifty as well. But I think it's par for the course. You know, the kind of rally that we have seen, some kind of a pullback, some kind of consolidation will be par for the course. But let's go across to Nimesh who joins us uh, for D Street Chatter. Nimesh, how are things looking? Well, a bit of consolidation, you know, and you rightly pointed out, uh, par for the course, uh, at record level, some bit of profit booking is visible. I guess today uh, there is a bit of buy, buy uh, selling as well. In fact, there's going to be a small market at close basket selling. I tell you, but it's a long list of stocks, but there is a, uh, nevertheless selling from larger FI. So that, that, that sums up the overall market mood. Uh, I guess uh, the sector which stands out today is, is clearly the metal names. And if you remember, since the beginning of the series, uh, I've been saying this that there's a feedback from the market that metals could be the could be the sector of the series. It's already up nine percent this this uh, so so far in the April series. We're seeing a lot of individual names buzzing into it. So this is one sector which is now seeing a bit of institutional interest as well. I understand some some long only funds and domestic mutual funds seems to be chasing some uh, some metal names as well for the last few days. So that's clearly playing out. I guess uh, the real test for this market will be next week when. A lot of earnings start coming in, mm. and that's what uh, I guess the way uh, you know everybody's looking out for TCS today. There was an Infosys upgrade. If IT uh, comes out and delivers number, right. then probably you'll see a bit of a rally in this market to continue. So that's a hope. But from a flow perspective, today there is a bit of selling pressure from FI. Okay, well put, uh, Nimesh. What about individual stocks? What are you looking at? Well, you know the the trend of blogs, uh, QIP is that continues. So the first stock on my list today is uh, five star uh, five star finance. That stock is under pressure today, but there is a large block, two percent equity got changed change hands and I understand one of the leading FI investor was a seller in, in that block deal so disclosures will be interesting there. The second name is PI Industries. That's that's marginally under pressure today but for the last few days there is delivery based buying happening. Some long only funds seems to be quite active buyers as well and interestingly City had today put out a note uh, for for the Q4 earning uh, preview and they've put out uh, PI Industries on the positive catalyst watch. So that's that explains uh, a bit of interest in PI Industries. The third stock is Sun Pharma Advanced Research. Now. Uh, again, this is the one stock which is not under institutional radar, not much been uh, you know, researched as well. Uh, this month, the stock is up 25%, wide, Y2D. In the last three months, the stock is up 59%. Some bit of h and interest seems to be back as well. And, and the city is anticipating or hoping for one of the drugs to, to be a blockbuster drug, and hence a bit of interest in that stock as well. And the last is Kotak Mahindra Bank. Within the financial names, uh, this, this, you know, Kotak Mahindra Bank stands out purely on back of flow. So for the for two, for last couple of days, uh, I understand the selling pressure from a leading long only fund is over and uh, and simultaneously there is a bit of buying interest as well. So it's a mix of sell uh, large selling pressure getting over and some buying interest as well in Kotak Mahindra Bank. Okay, thank you for that interesting list as always. Uh, let's get a handle on a few BTST calls. Mitesh is back with us. Mitesh? So I have uh, one sell side call as well. I think you know some stocks are showing signs of profit booking as the Nifty is still consolidating at uh, higher levels. Uh, uh, STVT on Coal India uh, with a stop at about uh, 442, 8.8 .8, and a target of around 430, 431 can be looked at on the downside and that's for uh, tomorrow most likely. But on the buying side, I have uh, a call as well and I would suggest some BTST on Aishal Motors with a stop below 4205 for targets of 4290. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Amitesh, uh, we'll come back to you for more but uh... Uh, that's it uh, for now. So those are BDSC trading ideas coming through. Uh, you know, the news flash at the bottom of the screen is important because uh, uh, ICICI Lombard, which was, which was, I mean, ICICI Lombard policies, etc., were not available on the Policy Bazaar platform so far. That's set to change with the products now being available on the Policy Bazaar uh, platform. Uh, so more uh, details on this one as we go along. But actually, the beneficiary... Uh, more than ICICI Loan Bar is a PB FinTech because, I mean, their business model, of course, is, uh, you know, they're an intermediary. They're a platform uh, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for consumers to be able to buy uh, these policies. Right? And they make a commission. Uh, so uh, they've got a very large player uh, that is in the form of ICICI Loan Bar now, which is going to be on their platform, which was not the case so far. Now, earnings season is about to kick off in just a couple of days from now. And it's uh, time for our special segment, What is a Quarter Thuck? IT services is what we are putting the spotlight on. Rima is here with details. Rima. Well, you know, the most important to think, uh, thing to track in this quarter's numbers will be the annual guidance from Infi and HCL Tech. Remember, demand recovery expectations have been pushed back. The street is now looking and hoping that things recover at least in the second half of FI25 and then that Accenture guidance further start the sentiment. So expect a cautious guidance from both Infi and HCL Tech. 
For Infi, the street is working with an FY25 constant currency revenue growth guidance of 3 to 5%, for HCL Tech, 4 to 6%. But then there are some in the optimistic camp who believe the numbers could be on the higher side. So 2 to 6% is the broad range for Infosys. For HCL Tech, it's about 4 to 7%. But it's also the pace of recovery which will be monitored. Now, the key question is, is the risk of a disappointing or a low guidance at least partially priced in into the stocks? Because the Nifty IT index is down 4.5% in the last one month, while the IT, the broad benchmark index, is up 1, 1.5%. So there has been that underperformance. underperformance. Names like Infi down 8% in the last one month. Wipro, for instance, is down 6%. ACL Tech is down 5.5%. Also off late, we've seen a few brokerage upgrades on individual stocks. So CLSA upgraded a TCS and HCL Tech to an underperform. They upgraded a Tech Mahindra to a buy from an outperform. JP Morgan to upgraded select stocks. So persistent became an overweight. They upgraded an LTI Mindtree and a KPIT Tech from an underweight to a neutral. JP Morgan went on to say the negative price action over the last one month appears to already bake in some weakness, keeping absolute downsides limited. Again, even though maybe the worst is over, the recovery, remember, will be gradual and back-ended. In fact, there are uh, many who believe on the street that earnings may have bottomed out already in the December quarter or it may bottom out in the March quarter, but the recovery is not going to be immediate. It's going to be a very slow-paced, gradual recovery. Uh, and on the whole, this year in FY25, companies are likely to report a low to mid-single-digit kind of revenue growth. These are the forecasts for the full year, FY25. And as you can see, it's not going to be a good year. Low to mid-single digits is the revenue growth. Now, coming to Q4 numbers, right? The quarter which is upon us. Now, this quarter assumes less of an importance. It's backdated. The street is looking ahead. In terms of numbers, expect TCS to lead uh, the charge here. 1.3% is a constant currency revenue growth forecast on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. The reason why TCS's numbers look up one, because of the ramp up of the BSNL deal. And two, because if you remember in Q3, the management did talk about BFSI showing some signs of green shoots recovery on a quarter on quarter basis. But largely, it's a negative growth expected for Infi, Wipro, and an LTI mine tree. So most of the large caps are going to have a subdued quarter, barring a TCS and an HCL tech, according to the CNBC TV18 poll. This quarter also assumes importance from a CEO change. Uh, remember, Wipro has already announced that Theory uh, Delaporte, the current CEO, will be stepping down before his term comes to an end. They've announced the appointment of Srinivas Palya. So is there going to be a change in strategy under the new CEO? And Tech Mahindra, where the CEO change was already announced, Mohit Joshi has come on board. But what he did say is that the turnaround strategy will be revealed in April. So. Um, if the street is betting on Tech Mahindra's turnaround plans, this is the quarter you need to focus on. For Infi in particular, one word, watch for the possibility of buyback. The last one ended in February of 2023, so they're eligible to announce a buyback. But you know, in a nutshell, Q4, weak quarter, no substantial improvement compared to the December quarter, but less important. Watch for the FI25 guidance by Infi and HCL Tech and the pace of recovery on revenues and margins. And this finally is the valuation play. And on an average, Citi is saying the NSC IT is trading at 25 times forward multiple versus a pre-pandemic five-year average of 18 times. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Reema, for that neat uh, summary. In fact, let's listen in to JP Morgan's Ankur Rudra, what he had to make of the revenue growth outlook for IT companies. Let's look at the scale IT services companies to start with, where ability to grow very, very strongly, especially in double digits, appears to be relatively lower. We think the, the scale IT services companies, companies, let's say above a certain threshold, call it $5 billion or so, can probably grow in the medium, I would say the mid to high single digits sort of ballpark in that sort of range. Maybe they might see one or two years of slightly stronger growth. The second group, I would say, is the larger mid-sized companies uh, across IT services and, and engineering services. Engineering services as a subset, I think that's one subset which has seen lower penetration where growth can be meaningfully higher. We would expect growth there, which currently ranges between high single digits to, let's say, double digits, can be structurally at you know low to mid-teens uh, for at least four or five years. So they can grow a bit faster. So, I, you know, we think that what's interesting is in the last two or three quarters, uh, I think what's accepted is that we've seen a significant amount of bottoming out, bottoming out of demand. 
So to that extent, I think revenue momentum appears to have bottomed out. But the challenge really is that when does this see an upturn? And we don't have visibility of that yet. So why we have seen an element of bottoming out on, on revenue, on demand, the, the visibility of recovery is, is not super clear. And we can, I think the, the confidence on, on bottoming out also is supported by some other factors. I think it's, it's broad, it appears to be relatively broad based. We've seen some uh, recent indicators like hiring indices uh, suggesting something similar. But I think the sort of the, the, the tougher question to ask is an answer is the, is, the, is the timing of the recovery from here on. And that question that Ankur asks is whether that recovery is going to play out in financial year 25 or in calendar year 2025. That's the critical point of debate right now. Well, let's move on from IT and go back to everything that's happening in the materials and commodities space. You just saw those news flashes on Coal India. We're learning from sources that the coal ministry wants several new coal mines to become operational by the end of this year itself. Our colleague Rachna is here with more details. Rachna, tell us, what are you picking up? Right. Ahead of an expectedly hot summer, the coal ministry is taking significant steps toward enhancing a country's thermal capacity by adding about 100 million tons. And these 100 million tons of capacity will be added by making 20 new mines operational by the end of this year. Now, sources have told CNBC TV 18 that of these 20 allotted mines, 10 have gone to Coal India and 10 have been made available for private companies to meet their manufacturing demand. The primary goal of this uh, move is to ensure that there's an adequate supply uh, because this year there's going to be an increased demand for power. So in turn, to reduce the need for coal imports, the thermal capacity is being ramped up. These new mines are spread across the states of Maharashtra, Jharkhand, Odisha, West Bengal, Chhattisgarh. And this comes at a time when India's thermal capacity relies heavily on coal. Hence, so much push has been made uh, to make these coal mines operational by the end of this year. Analysts have projected that with opening of these 10 new mines for coal India, uh, India's total therm thermal capacity could surpass 300 gigawatts, uh, whereas it was at 260 gigawatts by February this year. Now, this comes at a time when peak power demand this summer is expected to be about 384, and which is up from 240 last year. By this, the thermal capacity will be able to suffice about 300 gigawatts. Well, uh, push to get more coal out, right? Uh, get 20 new mines, 20 of these new mines, 10 from Coal India, 10 others, but get all of them up and running operational uh, or, you know, this year itself. So that's the push coming through from uh, the ministry, coal ministry. Uh, which is uh, which we are seeing. So, you know, we'll be interested to get some perspective from Coal India management as well, and we'll try and get them on uh, to talk about this. Rashan, thanks very much uh, for that. That's an important story. We'll take a break. We're back on the other side. Jay Bala of Catch the Chaos with us in just a bit. Welcome back. Counting down to market close. There is an, another important story that we want to highlight. ICSA Lombard has entered into a strategic partnership with Policy Bazaar. Yash joins in with the details. Yash. Well, uh, this partnership is happening between two giants in their respective fields. Uh, one is, of course, general insurance industry for ICSA Lombard and uh, insurance aggregator platform for uh, Policy Bazaar. Uh, now, there's a partnership which has been signed, an agreement which has been signed between ICSA Lombard and Policy Bazaar. And uh, through this particular agreement, now onwards, the ICICI Lombard products will be available on Policy Bazaar platform. Imagine so far, uh, Policy Bazaar was uh, the country's largest insurance aggregator, not having the country's largest private general insurance company. But now with this particular agreement, that particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, absence changes uh, and uh, ICICI Lombard products will be available both 
on the online business that is policybazaar.com uh, as well as the offline business which is uh, Policy Bazaar platforms as far as ICICI Lombard products are concerned. Uh, the reason why I say this is big and a big positive for uh, PV Fintech is because uh, Poli uh, ICICI Lombard has a large market share when it comes to general insurance uh, industry, almost about 9% uh, market share and with that all of that traffic really uh, you know uh, gets uh, gets gets uh, uh, going on uh, the Policy Bazaar platform and the deleveraging starts from that point. Okay, all right, got that, Yash. Thank you very much for that policy bazaar in uh, focus. And uh, the stock is now reacting quite positively uh, to that tie-up uh, that they have done with ICICI Lombard. Let's move on now and welcome our next guest on the show. We have Jay Bala of Cash the Chaos joining in. Jay, good to have you on. Thanks for being with us. So uh, today is a bit of a consolidation day, but otherwise this market has just gone literally one way and that's up and higher. Just tell us about banks first, because what's changed in this leg is finally banks are now participating. In some sense, they've kind of led this, this final you know, new high that we've seen on the Nifty as well. So what are the next levels in the bank Nifty? Any specific trades that you're, you're looking at here? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on the show, Sulby. You know, banking index wasn't supposed to go higher, and it has done that. But, you know, it, it's, it's still struggling. It's not a clean move. And the move from the recent low of 2024 is a choppy overlapping move. So that signals that this move is once again a limited move. But the resistance are higher by, by, the, by the banking index consolidating sideways. It just bought some extra time and, and uh, headroom higher. So the resistance comes at about 49,855 and then uh, 52,000. So uh, 49,855, if markets value, you know, came in before that, uh, the banking sector in particular, then it will probably be, be coming from uh, SBI and um, um, SPI below 750 will trigger, uh, could trigger the fall. So, um, yeah, so limited up upside for the banking index, and I'm positive on one of the uh, uh, banking name. Uh, I mean, when we discuss stocks, I'll give you the name. Why don't you tell us, Jay, <laughs> which is that, uh, what's that name? <laughs> yeah, it's IDFC yeah. First Bank, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been one of the underperformers. It's moved from the, it's 52-week highs. It seems, seems to have completed a, a correction. And uh, the recent low of 75 looks likely to hold, and um, it, it probably heading back to 103. So it's uh, it's likely to clock, uh, clock, uh, clock fresh 52-week highs. Um, but you know uh, we are in the late stages of the markets, so you know allocation should be uh, much lower than normal. Okay, so be a little careful. Late stages of the market. Uh, that's that's an interesting sort of uh, point uh, that you're putting out there. Uh, give us some more insights into sort of what makes you a little cautious right now and maybe throw in a word on Reliance. Reliance has not participated in this last leg at all. If anything, it's been very sluggish on, uh, you know, almost as a counterweight. What thoughts here? Yeah, that's right. Reliance, you know, to me, it seems to have completed a, a significant uh, move at 30, 30, 30, I was expecting 30, 50, it's done 30, 25 odds. So, you know, it's coming off from there. If it were to break 2800, that will be uh, marking a significant uh, uh, turn for the stock. So uh, much caution there. And uh, the reason for my cautiousness comes from the overall global picture. You know, we have uh, a breakout in, in the US 10 year yields, US 2 year yields, and we have a breakout in, 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 in Brent. We have, uh, you know, breakout in many commodities. And Usually, I've all been of the opinion, you know, for the last 14 years, I've been pointing out how risk assets move in tandem and uh, dollar is on the other side. But now what's happening, along with uh, rising crude, you know, dollar index is also moving. So, you know, we have equities, uh, dollar, uh, 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 bond yields and commodities moving together. So this is not sustainable. So something is going to break. So be, be very, very cautious. This is the reason for my uh, caution. You know, speaking of commodities, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, that upshoot that we're getting, whether it's oil, whether it's gold, now silver is playing catch-up. What do you make of it? Which are the charts that are still looking stronger? And, uh, you know, what, what's the recommendation there? Because simultaneously, a lot of the equity stocks, which are sort of piggybacking on their, the commodity move, uh, they've all been surging higher, metals included. That's right. See, copper has got short-term upside spending. So it's got something I probably going to take out uh, 4, 435, uh, high-grade copper. And so, you know, that's the reason why you're probably seeing uh, strong moves in Hindustan zinc and, uh, uh, you know, Hindustan copper. And, um, you know, when it comes to commodities, fresh move, you know, we see, uh, I've been pointing to uh, Tokom rubber uh, and, uh, you know, cocoa uh, the past three, four weeks. 
and they have been continuing to do well. And a fresh breakout is coming in coffee. So coffee, you know, it's, it's trading thinly on uh, on NCDX. So you know, it's likely to take out the all-time high registered in 2011. So I always say, when you are looking at inflation, look at the three C's: crude, uh, cocoa, and, and coffee, mm. and copper to a very small extent. So you know, so there's, there's uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, push higher coming from these three C's, and coffee is probably going to fresh all-time highs. So you know, this is the fresh trade for me. And it's it's a it's breaking out of a double bottom on the weekly charts. It's a micro double bottom, but I've been bullish on uh -huh. coffee since 2019. Oh gosh, okay, Prashant, uh, cocoa is higher, coffee is higher, gold is higher. What is a woman to do? <laughs> and he's talking about you know multi-year chart breakouts. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, help out. <laughs> uh, where is where are resistances? No, no, no. nothing nearby, huh? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, see, I mean, last week I pointed out Nifty to, you know, drop back to 22,300 and then go to fresh uh, highs to about 22,700. It's done exactly that. It's coming It's coming down from 22,700. You know, if 22,300 breaks, now the, for the second time, I'll be a bit cautious. But, you know, the, I'm not completely sure if the Nifty has uh, put in a top. But time-wise, today is an important uh, time resistance. Then, uh, but to me, the, I think the market will likely to top around uh, 19th of April. 19th of April is a much bigger time resistance. So watch out for it. Until that point, I'll uh, consider the market is still up in the short term. Okay. okay. Well, Jay, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for that conversation. Uh, good chat as always. Appreciate you joining in uh, with that perspective on markets uh, uh, right now. So, you know, you got the market which is going to end down 25 points, uh, essentially, uh, there was, uh, you know, before we started the show at 2.30, the market had uh, dropped 25. When we started uh, the program and in the initial 10 minutes or so, till about 2.40, 2.45, there was a hint of a recovery, uh, but then it basically went right back. But nothing large at all, quiet, right? Absolutely flat. So 22.640, and you're not even, you forget about any longer term supports, etc. breaking. Uh, we've not even hit the 20 hourly average, which is uh, just above 22,600. So we didn't go there. Uh, at the uh, as far as the close is concerned, Nifty Bank did uh, a little better. The Nifty Bank will end about 0.2-0.3% uh, higher, and uh, you basically have the mid cap index, which also uh, mid cap and small cap indices actually, like yesterday, kind of underperforming a little bit. Small cap index actually ends up about a quarter percent because there was a sharp surge uh, from 215 onwards in the small cap index, but uh, mid caps absolutely flat is uh, what we had. Oh, absolutely, and I mean, had it not been for some of these private sector banking names um, like ICICI Bank and Axis, then the picture would have been not as flat on the Nifty because otherwise uh, it's been uh, a sort of a bit of a downbeat day. But you've got Apollo Hospitals, which is the big winner. We were just talking about metal stocks, so names like Hindalco did well. On the mid-cap screen, though the index was flat, I do want to end with some of the movers and shakers. And look at that move on Hindustan Zinc, out and out metals day. And some of these stocks, because of how Nigel explained the low float factor, 17% up, Tata Power, Vedanta, Godrej Properties, SBI Card, Page Industries, so quite a few movers and shakers in the mid-cap space. So watch out for Motilal Oswal, no stopping the stockbroking slash wealth management businesses listed in the market. Big day for Motilal and good day for Anandrati and for Novama Wealth as well. Well, with that, uh, it's curtains down on this edition of Closing Bell. Many thanks for being with us. The bell has gone, but uh, we will be back right after the short break to uh, talk about all the market action going forward and prep you up for tomorrow. Markets Forward coming up next.